Hello, everyone. We have about 30 people with us here. Um, super excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Kelly Westerling. I'm finishing my PhD in theater and performance at the City University of New York, but most importantly here today, I'm the director for the Haystack Scholars Program. Um, so I'm here in New York and I have traffic right outside my window and so I hope that uh, the traffic won't disturb this introduction too much. I'm super excited to have you here. We haven't done any of these webinars in a while with Haystack Scholars and so I'm super excited that we are uh, back in the game again. Um, you may ask yourselves, uh, what is Haystack Scholars, in case you haven't heard about it? Um, the Haystack Scholars Fellowship Program is an innovative student-driven community of graduate and undergraduate students who are all working in the intersection of the technology and the arts, humanities, and sciences. So each year we have a new cohort accepted into the program, and right now the cohorts run for two years, so they're overlapping two cohorts. Um, and currently I think we're up to over 1,200 Haystack Scholars in total. Um, in dozens of disciplines, over 150 colleges and universities are participating, ranging from small liberal arts colleges to large research one institutions all over the world, but primarily here in the US. Uh, our Haystack scholars all blog on the Haystack website. They host Twitter chats, they develop new projects, um, and they organize events like these webinars that um, you're all participating in today. And much of our work with, uh, with scholars centers on rethinking pedagogy, learning, research, and academia for the digital age. Uh, if you want more information about Haystack Scholars, you can go to our website, haystack.org scholars. Write it down. I will post it in the chat because now is not the time to go on it <laughs> because we're here today uh, because Richard Snyder and Sarah Evans, who uh, will be leading today's webinar, were interested in presenting their work with the tool Twine in research and teaching settings. Um, and Twine is an open source tool for telling interactive nonlinear stories, um, and you will see many examples of how to use that uh, today. I'm very, very excited because I haven't used Twine myself, and I only recently started familiarizing myself with it. So um, all of this is very new to me um, as well. So who are Richard and Sarah? Um, Sarah Evans is a PhD candidate from North Carolina State University's Communication R Rhetoric and Digital Media Program. Her dissertation work focuses on feminism and technology with an emphasis on digital game design for non-coders. And Richard Snyder is pursuing a PhD in English at Washington State University where he studies intersections between multimodality, visual culture, and book history in the context of early modern English literature and contemporary digital culture. Um, so the structure for today uh, is that I uh, will finish up this introduction. I'll hand over the presentation to Richard and Sarah, who will take you through a number of case studies and showing, way the, uh, the, showing you the way the, the twine works and um, ways that you can learn more about the tool. And after that, we'll have about five to 10 minutes for a Q&A. Um, you should all have access uh, in the, the interface itself. Um, uh, you have access to a chat where you can uh, type questions um, to the panelists, um, so you can you can um, easily do that there. Um, if you would rather use Twitter, uh, or if you want to tweet at any um, anything really, you can tweet questions to uh, at Haystack Scholars. Uh, you see it hugely on the little graphic that I have shared uh, right there. Um, so if you tweet questions there, I'll make sure that those questions get raised during the Q&A as well. So um, as we're going along, please make sure that you type down your, uh, any questions that you may have because Sarah and um, Richard are, are two experts today. The video will also be posted uh, to our YouTube channel afterwards where you can also find our uh, previous webinars on tools like Omica um, and uh, Scalar that we've had before throughout the years. So, uh, without further ado, I uh, will give uh, the word to Richard and Sarah, who will um, kick it off from here. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, thanks for the introduction. And thank all of you participants for coming here to learn about this tool today. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen so you can get a look at what Twine looks like. So here it is. Twinery.org is where you would go to access this tool. You can use it online. There's a browser version, but you can also download it and use it offline if you want. Um, I'm going to be showing the online version because it's, you know, for people who have internet, it's really accessible and it's really the easiest to do a lot of things with. So just to give you some background on this tool, 
Twine was originally created by Chris Klimas in 2009, um, and he is a Baltimore-based web developer, game designer, and writer. Um, but really, Twine got a lot of popularity as a game design tool in online communities, specifically queer online communities. So people like Anna Anthropy, Porpentine, and Merrick Kopas were making these radically different games using Twine. Um, and one of the most radical things about Twine is where most game design requires extensive coding knowledge. Here, you can make really interesting, complex things. Sometimes they're simple, but they're still cool. Um, but you can do that with very little, you know, complexity in terms of the back end. So Twine also got a lot of attention from the game Depression Quest. So if anyone remembers um, or has heard of a few years ago Gamergate, this is pretty much the game that sparked that controversy. So Depression Quest was a game made in Twine by Zoe Quinn, and it's basically a game about what it is to have depression. So you're seeing it right now. This is the game. You might say that there's a lot of text here, but um, that's the basis of Twine. It is text-based uh, interlinking stories. So, you know, just to go through this a little bit to show kind of how it's working. It does actually have music to it, but I'm not sharing that because it'll probably compete with my voice. But, um, you know, so you can have images in Twine. You clearly see there's some formatting to the background. There's all these different links. And the way that Zoe Quinn designed this is to describe situations and then give you options. So the player is meant to um, choose options based on what they would do in this situation, but to kind of explore the way depression uh, is for people. You can see that this is not an option that you can actually you know, choose. So it might seem like an option, but it's not because of your depression. So this game caused a lot of controversy because people were saying it's not a game. Uh, it was not a game that people had to pay for. So it appeared in Steam, which is a popular game place. And people were just so angry it was here because it's so different from what you think of when you think of video games. Um, but it has prevailed and you know, a lot of more people have been using Twine. So I just want to go through a little bit of what Twine can actually do. Um, but I think Richard wanted to say a few things about it before I got into that. Yeah, I was just going to say um, one of the things that I, I started using Twine last year, <clears throat> and so I'm relatively new to it. And the um, Sarah briefly mentioned how quickly you can learn about Twine and, and how easy it is to kind of start working with. And that's, to me, kind of the main draw. So I'm kind of coming at this as somebody who's uh, still learning it, who's trying to use it in the classroom. Um, so I think the main thing for all of you listening who haven't tried it is uh, it's really attractive because of its ease of use. And um, it's, it's just so quick to pick up and learn, even if you have no coding experience. Absolutely. Um, and so to get started, all you really have to do is click this, use it online. Now, you can see here that I already have some stories. If you're new, this will be blank. Uh, but to create a new story, you just click over here and you can name it whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to put that in for now. So it brings you to a page like this. You click the passage. You're going to want to make sure that you have a start passage. And then the basis of Twine is connecting passages through links. Um, so I'm just going to write a very short thing. So right here where I put these brackets around the word bad, that's going to create a link. So I have to connect it to a new passage. So I have to name the new passage, whatever I put in those brackets. I'm literally just making things up as I'm doing this. But so this is the basis <laughs> of Twine. You um, just connect passages. So already I can show you, you just click play. And it's going to just do that for you. It's going to create that link. So 
you have the text, you click the link, it brings you to the next thing. And you can, um, you know, fill up your page with as many different passages as you want. You can connect them differently. And, um, you know, again, that's the basis. You can do a lot just by giving people different options. To kind of show what is possible, I created this sampler. So again, this is the back end. So here you can see the way that all of the links connect. And this is actually going to be um, one of the things that Richard and I talk about, about why Twine is so useful in teaching and research um, contexts, because you do actually get a lot from seeing this visual representation of your story. So I'm gonna start this up. Um, another good thing about Twine is there's a ton of online resources for this. If you just go into Google and search Twine 2 resources, because there are two different versions, Twine 2 is the most recent version, it is the most user friendly. Um, there's just tons of stuff out there. Let me go back real quick um, to the home page. The easiest way is to just click the help right there and it'll bring you right to the official Twine wiki. So there's tons of stuff here, um, but there's also a lot of fan need <clears throat> resources as well. Yeah, I started off uh, learning just by going into the Harlow, which is one of the, there's two, right? Harlow and um, the formats. Uh, yeah, the formats. So I went into uh, just the guide for how to do things basically. And uh, yeah, so there's Harlow and Snowman are the two I'm kind of familiar with, but Harlow 2.0. Um, I went in there and just started looking at what I could do and messing around. And I messed around enough that I made some stuff and um, it's that easy uh, and I don't have any really coding background or anything like that. Right. It's just super fun to play around with and see if you wanted to explore the tool that way, you could click on the documentation there. Um, and Harlow is the default story format. The Snowman and Sugarcube are going to be um, a little more complex. So once you use Harlow, then you can move on to those and learn how to use those ones, which are more HTML than this one. This does a lot of the, you know, back coding for you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So Twine is an open source tool for telling interactive stories. Um, and this is a file that I can actually send out to anyone who's interested in having it. Because, you know, again, by having this file, you'll have the back end coding and you'll be able to have these directions on how to do the different things. So as I showed before, you connect passages through creating links. And to make a link, you write the name of a passage between double square brackets like this. Passage titles are case sensitive. So if you know the one you're writing in your text looks like this, and then the one you create uh, has a capital L, they will not connect. And as you saw earlier, it'll show you a big red X to show that that's not really working. But um, we can quick go here to the logistics. So the thing about Twine, especially using the browser version, is it saves your work automatically. You can archive it to make sure that um, it's definitely saved, but Twine is gonna save your work automatically. Uh, if you're using the browser version, you cannot clear your cache because that's where everything is saved. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> um, as Richard noted, the default story format is Harlow 2, and it's the most beginner friendly. And again, it uses HTML. So I'm just going to go back like that. Automatically, it'll generate those backlinks for you. So if I click this, it's going to bring me to the links. So links allow you to give the player of your twine options about what paths they want to take. But the funny part about this is sometimes you don't want your player to know that two different links actually direct your player to the same passage, such as in the sentence above. To achieve this, you add a mask to the link by writing the text you want revealed on the left side and the passage name you want to direct to on the right and put a pipe between them. A pipe is that tall thing. It's usually found above your enter key. So this is what you would use to create this. So both of these are actually going to link to the same passage, even though they say different things. And really, like I said before, that's all you need to know to get started, just making links. Um, but you can actually do a lot more. You can add media, such as images. We've got some cute dogs. Images um, like this are hosted somewhere. This one's hosted on Imager, and then you just put the embed link to get that there. You can also um, use GIFs 
again, more cute dogs. And again, I have some instructions here on how to do that, but for the sake of time, um, I'm just gonna kind of demonstrate. And then again, we can send this out if you're interested. Um, and you can embed uh, YouTube videos as well. Something to note about that is if you're using someone else's content, sometimes YouTube has restrictions that don't allow you to actually link to that. So um, it's always better to make your own content if you can. You can also link to outside content, but that can be tricky because it'll open a um, new window sometimes, or sometimes it'll open in this window, and then you can't navigate back without starting from the beginning. So you always have to be careful for that. Um, and really adding media are some of the more complex things. You can add a lot of emphasis to the text just by uh, doing very easy back end stuff, which I can show you just by clicking into here. So to bold something, you just put the quotes to underline you know, these. And again, if you get this file from me, you can just copy and paste the formatting and write whatever you want in this part. But it's really not even that difficult. So let me get that back up. Um, so you can add multiple effects to text. Uh, also, hooks and macros are really useful. You can create a lot of ambience through text effects alone. So for example, these are all of the different things that you can do. So you can make things blink. You can have things be blurry. Um, you can do things mirrored or upside down, rumbling. Um, and this is, again, actually really easy to do, especially if you're just going to copy and paste. So again, to look at the back end, you just put text style and then whatever the thing you want it to do in here. And then in the single brackets, which is the hook, you would write whatever text you want in there that will be affected. Um, and the thing about hooks and macros, you can see that they're connecting to a lot of different ones, is because they can do a lot of different things. So you can change the fonts with macros. So this is the back end, and then it would appear like this in the actual Twine story. So here's what you would type in, and then this is what you would get. Um, using fonts in this way, uh, you have wingdings down here. Hopefully everyone remembers those from the word days. Um, but the thing about this is it's only going to affect these local pieces. Whatever you put in these brackets is what will be affected. Sometimes you want to affect more than that. You want to have the style of the entire um, twine look different. So you would do that through the style sheet. Um, changing the style sheet can change the entire look. It'll affect every passage. And Depression Quest is is all formatted using style sheet pretty much. Right. I think so. It's also um, made using Twine 1, so that's why it looked different. Um, I'll bring it back up. It has this sidebar. So Twine 1 uh, is the original Twine, and it is quite different. So you would look up completely different resources for that. Um, it definitely has style sheets, though, because Twine 1 just has a regular white background with black text on it. Right. Um, to change your style sheet, you would go into here and edit your sto story style sheet. There's nothing here right now because uh, it's, it's in the default. And then I could uh, send out with this. I'm just gonna copy, I have this. This is like a pre-made basic style sheet that's just gonna change a few things. It looks really crazy and intimidating, but it's actually, you know, again, like Richard indicated originally, you just kind of mess around with stuff. So this is what it looks like. And all I did was copy and paste this from the internet. And if we want to see how that changes the way the story looks, it looks completely different and it gives a completely different feel to what you know the content is. So the background is white, the font is blue, it's in Garamond font, the links are red. Um, it, it changes it quite a bit. And then before I you know bore you all to tears, just going over these little technical things. I just want to show that you can also change the colors locally using hooks. So you can see that it'll um, recognize many colors by name. Uh, if you go to the, like the HTML colors that are recognized, there's really tons. So there's all the regular ones like red, orange, yellow, but then there's also, you know, indigo, magenta, teal, things that have all sorts of 
intense names that um, you might not even think of. Uh, and also the last thing before I pass this over to Richard is um, the best way to um, upload or save anything if you actually want to have access to the back end file. So basically if you want to have access to this stuff is to import it here. So you would download it and import it. But if you don't want people to have access to that, you can just share it and you would do that with this website. So this is free twine hosting. Um, it, you have to log in with Twitter, so you do have to have that. Then you um, save your Twine file, upload it here, name your game, and then it'll publish to your Twitter, and then that link you can use to share it anywhere on the web. All right, and I'll just pass that over now. Okay, um, yeah, so those are kind of the basics, and what I'm gonna talk about um, really quickly is how easy it is to use uh, Twine for kind of personal projects or creative writing. And <clears throat> uh, something that I think Twine is really suited for is just kind of messing around with nonlinear narratives. And so if you um, are familiar with games that kind of change as you play through them, like uh, Dragon Age or um, anything like that, then you'll be kind of familiar with this idea that your actions kind of have consequences. and um, stripping that down to starting out with uh, kind of a creative writing project in Twine means that um, it acts kind of like a choose your own adventure. Um, at least that's how I like to explain it to people sometimes. And um, so you already saw a great example of in Depression Quest of somebody using it kind of to share their experience. And I think it's a really powerful tool for that kind of um, creative writing and, and personal writing and just kind of a different way, a different genre um, of, of writing. So something that I've been doing is uh, right now I'm working on just in my spare time. <laughs> um, uh, so I've been struggling with anxiety since I was a kid and, um, and OCD. And so I've had this idea um, years ago to write something uh, that tried to share that experience. I did that when I was an undergrad tried to get people in my head when I'm going through um, really hard times with that. And so lately what I've been doing is working on that in Twine. And um, I'm not going to screen cast that right now. <laughs> uh, it's, it might be a little too personal um, at this point. But basically what it does is it allows me to um, put the, the player in my shoes and let them make decisions and it's funny because I didn't even see Depression Quest until after I started working on this, but I kind of started doing the same thing with denying the player choices um, or ha often what <clears throat> kind of gave me the idea to use Twine is uh, having choices bring them back to the same result uh, just over and over and over. So kind of emulating that circular thinking or intrusive thoughts um, that you'll kind of get trapped in. Uh, so I think even for, uh, that's been really uh, useful for me for just kind of thinking about sharing that with friends and family. Um, but also just, uh, I just have fun sometimes uh, writing little things for my friends to play um, and trying to get used to this idea of, uh, and one thing that I, that I originally read about Twine was, you know, it's called Twine because you often have these, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but you often have these um, choices that branch out and then come back together to uh, a central point and then uh, branch back out again and come back together. And so it's kind of twining together. Um, and so designing in that way makes it so that you can allow for a lot of choice, but also kind of keep uh, the narrative going in a direction that you want. Uh, so I, I really like that for creative writing. I think it's really useful. And um, we're also going to talk about, or Sarah, did you want to say anything about uh, personal projects? Have you done anything? with that? Uh, yeah, um, I can demonstrate what you meant about the intertwining and talk about a personal project. Um, so for me, one of the best ways to learn um, any type, I'm going to share my screen, um, any type of new tool is to just come up with a project and try to execute it. And so this was one of my first Twine games. Um, it's called Hard Work, Leave Me Alone. And as you can see, it's really complex. It's got a lot of interlinking uh, things. Some of these aren't even finished. Like they don't, 
go anywhere, but a lot of them, you know, loop back on each other and stuff like that. So as you can see, it can get very complex in here um, if you don't, you know, keep an eye on it. But you might also want this, which I did for this story. So this was my story about um, going to the office and we have kind of like an open cube area. Um, going to the office and trying to navigate to your area without getting, you know, kind of caught by conversations and things like that. Because, you know, we all know that when we're trying to to go to work to do our job, we are, you know, trying to do just that. But it's really easy to get distracted by, you know, interesting conversations and stuff like that. Um, so in this, you know, example, they're talking about... Uh, Game of Thrones or something like that. I made this a while ago. But, uh, you know, this was a personal project that I used just to try to learn the tool, um, see what was up, and also kind of really think about what it's like to, you know, try to navigate. You know, this isn't a big issue or anything, but it's something that I think we can relate to when you're trying to get to work, but there's, you know, distractions at every, uh, at every turn. Uh, and the funny part was, with this story, I kind of ended up almost trolling myself because each time I would try to write one of those conversations that capture you, like I found myself having to make more and more of these passages. And so like I was actually enacting the thing I was trying to explain on myself while I was making the game. So that was a different way for me to also um, interact like with that experience. So that's you know one way that uh, I've used this as a personal tool. Yeah, I really recommend just jumping in and getting started. Um, it's it's really easy to um, to kind of just write it almost like you'd write a story. If you don't want to make any branching choices right off the bat, you can just write it, you know, really linearly just to get used to to how the linking works. And then maybe you'll hit a point where you're saying, okay, what are the choices that the player could have here? I mean, I definitely recommend starting off just just by trying to make something out of linking. Um, I think you can look at the complexity we have in, in our digital technology today, all based on kind of like ones and zeros or the binary choice, right? And it can get so complex, um, just that aspect of it that, as you saw in Sarah's example. So, I mean, you can just start there and, and not mess around with anything else for quite a while. <laughs> um, next, we were going to kind of talk about um, Twine and research. And uh, so I'm kind of um, unexpectedly using Twine in a research project. Um, I'm working on the, with uh, several um, scholars on the Oxford digital edition of Edith Wharton's work um, that will be coming out in the next few years here. And for that project, uh, we were kind of pitching ideas around and they want to do some, some interesting things and some things that will kind of um, get people's attention. And so we talked about things like interactive maps of New York City um, and kind of tracing uh, storylines through the novel using a scalar book. And I happen to mention, hey, like, why don't we try doing something with uh, Edith Wharton's handwriting? Because as somebody who's now working with it, um, it's difficult to it's really difficult for me to read. <laughs> I'm not a Wharton scholar. And so I'm working with someone who is um, one of the um, foremost scholars on Edith Wharton and, and she's read thousands and thousands of pages of Wharton's work in her handwriting. And, um, and so we've kind of had this interesting learning experience anyway. And so, um, so the people she was pitching to uh, really liked that idea. So uh, we've kind of started working on um, a game idea using Twine in which, um, and unfortunately I wanted to have something to show today, but unfortunately um, the, they were delayed getting me the, the scans from the first, from the manuscripts, um, but they should be saying them over in the next few weeks. And I can, I can throw that up on Twitter. Um, but essentially what, what's happening is um, we're just using Twine to kind of create a simple quiz. And so um, you can level up, get points, things like that by, identifying uh, what Edith Wharton's actually saying. And Twine has the function to, that allows um, players to, to input something, to type something in. Um, so we're trying to, 
to make it so that you have to perfectly copy her handwriting and and or perfectly read it and then type in what you think she's saying and then you go up to the next level of difficulty and i think right now in the kind of the current climate of um digital editions and and digital projects like these kind of really quick simple easy to put together games the output to html i mean you can just host it really really easily um, i've actually hosted twine games on dropbox and sent people a dropbox link it's that simple um, those kind of things i think are a really good way to say how can we make this more accessible or interesting um, how can we have people engage with this uh, kind of a free aspect of the research um, and i'm really looking forward to to uh, getting that done so when that's done i'll put that up on my on my Twitter, I might put a link on uh, on the Haystack uh, Slack group as well. Yes, and I've um, used Twine's visual backend a lot. Um, I really like that idea of you know having to read the handwriting and inputting it because one of the things you can do is have um, a little screen that pops out that allows you to input your own. Uh, you know information so if you wanted to program it to use um, someone's name throughout the story you could do that pretty easily again just you know I don't have it um, on hand right now but just by copying and pasting you can um, you know achieve a lot of really cool effects and that, that is yeah I think I think I have an example of, of putting of an input um, in my my teaching example later so I'll try to point that out nice um, uh, people are knocking next door, so I hope my dog doesn't start barking. Um, so one of the ways that I've used this um, in teaching is um, right now I'm working with some people on campus um, and we're making twine tutorials for um, social workers to use with victims and perpetrators of domestic abuse um, to use it to use making things in twine as a bonding activity and um, we're using kind of situations where you can uh, you know so we're using it in terms of like we're putting kind of like theory concepts in there in a narrative way so that you know parents can uh, go through these twine stories and kind of see that the way that they are parenting is a particular style that has particular con consequences. So for example, you know, there's a scenario where um, a daughter comes home uh, late and then there are some options about how you would react to that. And then it gives you some information about like, this was a permissive um, parenting style. Um, you know, continuing this may result in these kinds of behaviors from your child. Um, and so that's one way that we've been using it kind of as like a um, uh, simulation of sorts. And that can be used in multiple arenas, so not just necessarily um, social work, but also um, like I could see it being used in PR. So if there's like a PR disaster, what are some options of how you would handle this and what would the consequences be? Um, I think there's a lot of different ways that this can be used just by, you know, again, creating different scenarios that someone has to navigate through. And I was looking at the questions here. So one that is relevant to this is um, someone asked if you can do um, like are passages completely static or can you program them, them to work together? For example, say you have $5 to spend and how fast you spend it will depend on the order that you make choices. Can you program it to calculate values? Um, and so yes, you can do that. You can uh, program variables into that. That is one of the more complex things where you're going to have to be um, copying and pasting uh, things into many passages to track the variable and stuff like that. But it's totally possible. And there's a lot of resources um, on the official forums and wiki for that, but also um, as community resources as well. Um, and then we do we want to talk about the uh, the research? Oh, okay, I see. Um, so yeah, so another way that I've used this for research is um, I did a field practitioner survey. Uh, and by that, I mean I, so this is my field. You'll see maybe names if you're familiar with uh, feminist game studies um, or game studies period. So I used um, the people whose work I was citing to see who they cite, what, um, 
you know, what are their CVs like? Who are they publishing with? What conferences are they presenting at? Um, and so this allowed me to create kind of like, you know, you can see all these different arrows and um, intersees of people. Um, it kind of showed me like, where are the conferences that I need to be going to as a scholar trying to, you know, break into this um, area? And who are the people that I um, see cited a lot? Who are the people that I, um, my work fits with the most? And how does their work fit with other people's work? And so I created this, um, you know, visual to help me do that. And if you actually went into any of these, so full disclosure, Dr. Nick Taylor is my advisor. So that's one of the reasons, but, you know, here's some background on him and people, um, you know, about his disc, people he's worked with, co-authored with, projects he's worked on um, and stuff like that. And then I could navigate it either way. So I also use this as a presentation aid um, in the class that I made this for. Uh, so there's multiple ways that this back end can be used in a creative way. Yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. I want to do that. <laughs> um, all right, is that all for research? Um, or do you want to move on to teaching? Yeah. yeah that'd be good. Okay, so um, mostly what I've used Twine for is uh, is um, trying to make something for my English 101 classroom. So I'm a PhD student in literary studies and I've taught English 101 for a couple years now. And I'm always trying to find kind of new things to do uh, with them. And one of the concepts that can be really hard to teach is rhetorical analysis. So kind of looking at situations and texts uh, through a rhetorical point of view. And so I thought, hey, why not use Twine to kind of um, have them practice rhetorical analysis in kind of fictional scenarios. So kind of that simulation idea. And so I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, and a note about my um, setup. I'm using Twine on the, I can't talk and click at the same time apparently. <laughs> so I'm using Twine um, here on the, the desktop edition. So it looks a little bit different and it's one update behind as well when I logged on today, I realized. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of uh, what it looks like on the desktop. And I saw a question about um, if you, you know, if you don't, um, if you clear your cache, like are you gonna lose things? That's, that seems like a bad idea because eventually I'm gonna clear the cache. And I agree with that. So if you, if you want to, um, you can save your your uh, Twine games and uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. So I really recommend um, checking out the desktop uh, edition if you're worried about that. You can save them as, I think they just save as HTML files and then you, um, you can copy those or move them around or back them up however you want. So if you're worried about that, I recommend doing, doing that. Um, so this is the very first Twine game that I, that I made for my class. And it's it's pretty, I guess pretty complex, but it's definitely mostly just linking. Um, and so if you wanna, like, you can look at the start. Um, this, <laughs> that was my uh, first image tag there. So I called this Adventures in Rhetoric, um, and you can see where I edited things here. So let's play through a little bit of it. So what I had students do is, um, basically I wanted them to go through this and then my, as far as I got, um, was to have them essentially take notes and then come into class and talk about um, that experience. That's kind of, that was the most basic way I could use it in class. And so one note I want to say at the beginning that was kind of interesting with this experience was, um, not only did I not have any questions about what Twine was or how games work, um, but I also had, um, no questions about uh, like, I don't know, accessing the game or any technical issues. Like I had nothing like that. Um, and I know that almost all of my students accessed it and did it, did it over the weekend. Um, and somebody brought up that Dropbox may not be hosting anymore. Um, and so my previous comment about using, like hosting it on Dropbox is probably inaccurate. I haven't tried that in a few months now 
probably like six months. So, <clears throat> but when I used this in my class, what I, all I did was I put it on my own Dropbox and sent them a link because um, it seemed the easiest way to do it. And so they just double clicked the file and loaded it up. Um, and so what happened with that was uh, it took place over a weekend and we kind of went through this. So I tried to have them have their free writing notebook uh, ready and I try to make it about why uh, things were the, the right answer, made it low stakes. Um, <laughs> I wanted, I bolded the low stakes statement. Um, and so this is kind of what it looked like at the beginning. And I, I wanted to have this like little bit about like why we're doing this and um, they could review the elements of rhetoric as we went over them in our class. Um, so we have writer, designer, audience, text, and mode. And so once they got started, um, I would just describe situations. So this was before I could really, uh, I was really good at hosting or adding images or video or anything like that. And um, so I just kind of described uh, the classroom we were, we would normally be sitting in and just wanted them to kind of review by analyzing that rhetorical situation in the classroom, which we've done before. Um, so you can say, who is the writer designer? Um, and so like, if you click the, wrong answer, it gives you a point value. And so then you can, the idea was to share, uh, just either A, see how high you could get, or B, to kind of just, that would let me know um, in feedback when we met in class, kind of where people got to. Um, but then I also asked them to kind of record why they thought that. So this is really pretty simple. Um, and so it just kind of it became kind of like a, um, when I got feedback on this from my advisor, he was kind of like, this is cool, but it's sort of a glorified quiz. Um, so this was a year or so ago, and I, what I did since then was just trying to kind of brainstorm some other, um, other things I can do with it. So this is my revised version. And um, so what you can see me doing here is kind of some of the same stuff. Um, and what I've added here is it's actually really easy to, to allow students to um, save their game. So you can save, save games and load games. Um, and that way they can save their progress or whatnot. And so I took some suggestions from some people, uh, some fellow students here and some advisors. Uh, and one of the ideas was to make it into kind of an AR game. And so what I have students doing in this is actually going around campus. And because you can access Twine uh, games on your phone through the browser, um, what I actually have them doing is hopefully um, sticking together in groups and going around and uh, around campus to, to various places. And so it kind of directs them around places on campus and gives them some um, options to actually analyze those environments that they're in um, live. And I tried to do some other stuff in here. So this is a prompt um, when they get something wrong, as it were, um, they're prompted to explain their answer. And then what I have it set to do is at the end of the game, which I'm still working on right now, I don't think, I don't remember where I wrote it. I don't know if I have it written out yet. But what it'll do is keep track of all of those different explanations for their wrong answers. And it prints out a bunch of other um, details from the game too. So oh, final output, here we go. So this is kind of um, partly what it's looking like right now. And um, so it'll state their name. It has uh, some of these different situations and keeps a record basically of kind of what they said and um, shows what they explain. Um, so this is kind of getting into some little more slightly more complicated stuff that I'm trying to do. It doesn't all work right now <laughs> perfectly, um, but as you can see, you can kind of start getting more complicated. Uh, and yeah, so I've gotten some pretty good feedback about this uh, so far. I haven't yet used this in the class, but you can kind of see, whereas I'm getting more experience with the tool, um, how this is sort of changing things. One idea uh, with this that I really like is allowing it to be uh, allowing students to write in 
the Twine experience itself in the Twine game, they get to write um, in response to me um, or in response to the game, and they get to that keep the game automatically keeps track of all of that. And so at the end, uh, I'm just asking them at this point to copy paste all that final output into a file that they can save and bring with them. And, and so we can talk about that and reference it in class. So it's definitely not perfect, but it's kind of coming along. Um, and of course, yes, you're right, is a little bit cringy from a pedagogy perspective, but um, taking some of the game ideas into account, um, I'm trying to to make it a little bit a bit of, a little bit of a, a challenge as they go on. Um, and then they can type in their answer here. It checks it against several different um, variations on what they could say for the right answer or for what I'm thinking of for the answer. So that's kind of what I'm working on right now with it. And um, yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and stop stop that there. Right, and so that was pretty much um, what we had to say about how we twine in teaching research and um, you know personal use for self-expression. Um, but before we get to Q and A, we just wanted to give a few tips about um, if you want to use twine to teach um, something. And I think that it's possible to use this in a variety of circumstances. Um, already in the questions, I've seen some people asking about um, some interesting uses for it. Uh, and it's definitely really like easy for students to learn. I've taught it in um, several different classes. I think they're a little more um, close to what Twine is. So I, you know, I've used it in game studies and multimedia production, which you know this fits really easily into. But like it's, you know, the basis of it is so simple and there are so many resources online for it that it's really, really something that's accessible for most students to use. Um, so um, real quick, some things uh, that I suggest if you are looking to teach it, uh, make sure that it's the right tool for what you want to use it for, because sometimes it can be easy to, you know, see um, a tool like this and just be like, oh, man, like this is going to get them interested, but it might not actually be the most useful tool for it. So, you know, make sure that there is actually uh, an outcome that you can that's going to be best, uh, you know, gotten to through using Twine rather than maybe something else. Also, I think it's useful to explain it the way that Richard explained it. Um, by contextualizing it in its history of, you know, choose your own adventure novels, which at this point, um, I don't even know if students know what those are, but, <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's the origin, right? Like, just to bring one into class. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's important to give a brief tutorial uh, in person about, like, how to do those basic things, because, again, you can achieve a lot just through copy and paste and basic linking. Um, and, you know, those little HTML things. Also, something that's going to make it easier for them, the students, to make interesting content as well as um, understand, like, what Twine can be used for is to have them play existing Twine games. And I think it's important to look up and have ones ready that you think are appropriate to your situation. So, like, um, if you were using it in a history class, you know, try to see if you can find any online that are about history things. That might be a little difficult because most of the ones you're going to find are going to be probably more fiction based. Um, but, you know, using ones, I use ones that just show like interesting creative uses of it. And I had a student, uh, that's the most interesting thing is the students always come up with these different uses that I never even could have thought of. This one um, student had a, you know, as you saw before, it's text based, but you can add images. They had like a book image, like moving on the screen in multiple places. So you had to like click it at the right time. And I was just so impressed with that because, you know, the way that I teach it, I just give them the resources. I give them the basics and I say, go run with it. And so far I haven't had any trouble. Everyone's, you know, created some really impressive stuff. And that's the last thing I'll say about that is making sure that you're giving them good current resources. Twine is this um, living thing. Uh, you know, when I showed the formats and stuff, you could see there was Twine 1, there was Twine 2, there's Snowman, Sugarcube, Harlow. There's all those different versions. So making sure that you're teaching a specific version to them and giving them resources for that specific version is going to be really important. 
And then I think Richard, you had maybe a few tips. Yeah, I just want to um, say again that, you know, starting off simple is probably the best way to go. Uh, I've only taught um, how to use Twine once, um, actually to some fellow graduate students, but it was, I, I dove in way too deeply uh, right away and kind of made it confusing. <laughs> and because um, I had gotten so familiar with it by that point. So I think just starting off with, with the linking um, is the best thing to do. And also, uh, when you do go to host your your files um, or your, sorry, when you save your your Twine games, um, I do recommend just uh, making sure that everything's kind of in order. So playing through it a few times um, to make sure that it actually does what you want it to do. I have found though that um, it tends to be pretty straightforward, you know, when you look at that visualization of the whole thing, um, you can see if anything is broken usually. And then um, it's actually, it's, so it's what we've shown you is, is kind of the basics, but it can get really deep. And if you have coding experience, programming experience, um, you can do some really impressive things. Um, it can crunch numbers and do all sorts of really cool stuff that I don't know how to do <laughs> and I'm hoping to learn. So um, uh, as a last note, I would say that it's kind of probably a, a gateway drug to making games um, in other languages or just kind of learning how variables and things like that work. Um, and you also get to learn HTML and CSS to an extent um, when you're using Twine. So it can be a great introduction to that for students. Um, and I'm planning on using it in a digital technology and culture 101 class next term to kind of uh, talk about um, linking between different things and how web texts work as well. So lots of ways to use it. And I think now we're going to um, see if we can answer some questions in the yeah. next couple minutes. Thank you so much, both of you, for this presentation. I'm sure that the 39 people who are still <laughs> watching uh, through the Zoom uh, interface and the almost 150 people, I think, who watched on other uh, platforms are like applauding in their um, in the rooms. I will be representative of all of those people. Um, we do have seven more minutes. I've been. I tried to. I posted a Google Doc in the um, chat window for all of you who um, are seeing the, the chat window um, where all the questions and comments that have come in are I've sort of dumped them in there in a very chaotic way but it's hopefully helpful um, I think that the first thing that that would be good to address uh, we got three questions that I think are sort of interrelated um, that have to do with the accessibility um, Anneli asked, do any of the Twine formats create accessible games? Franny added, how does Twine work on mobile? And Paul added, uh, does Twine offer guidance on user accessibility, which Franny also wanted an answer to. And I think all of those kind of can be addressed um, by uh, both of you probably because you have the, the experience. But do you have um, any answer to this little group of people? Um, Twine is very visually based. So um, in terms of accessibility, it does have some limitations in terms of that. Um, with mobile, um, it seems that certain games will work on certain mobile devices. <laughs> so it is possible for it to work on mobile, but um, it's definitely going to take some, you know, some testing out, which you know, most of this kind of work usually does anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of does Twine offer guidance on user accessibility, I haven't seen much in terms of that. But um, you know, I've been since getting these questions, I've been trying to find anything on the Twine Wiki or the forum. Again, those official resources, and I haven't really found anything. So it's super accessible in terms of. It's really easy to use, but if you have any learning impairments or anything like that, it's going to be probably more difficult. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Richard? I see that you're typing in the document, so maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe that's um, hard for you. To talk about. No, I. <laughs> yeah. No, I. I think that um, one thing I might, I, just off the top of my head, thinking because it outputs to HTML. If you already have software set up that that reads websites for you. I don't know, maybe that would that would make it work. Um, that'd be something I would try. 
uh, as far as uh, visual mm -hmm. accessibility or um, non-sighted accessibility. And then, of course, it's an uh, open source tool, so that might also be something that um, is easy to uh, plug into for any any of you who are attending, who are um, uh, who are uh, programmers too. Um, there was one other question that I want to lift up that Kelsey just asked, which I think is important. Um, the question is, is there any online community, Facebook group or otherwise, of educators, researchers user, using Twine that we could plug into to get ideas, see examples, and ask for help? The reason why I bring that up is um, because we are running out of time, and we probably won't get around to all the questions. And of course, we can all um, continue on Twitter or, or wherever. but. Um, that might be uh, there might be resources that are already out there and that the two of you know about not that I know of so that might be a, uh, hmm. a haystack uh, in initiative <laughs> yeah that sounds good do you you don't know any, anything about that either um, I know that there's um, Dan Frank at Clemson is kind of trying to put together a group um, working with twi scholars working with twine particularly with with uh, in composition and rhetoric but I think uh, it's broader than that too, so you might talk to him. Great, great. Thank you so much. And we'll see. Maybe what we can do is that uh, coming out of this, uh, we can create something on Haystack that uh, can function as a, a way of connecting uh, people who are interested in using this tool specifically in a pedagogical or research setting. I think that that could be a really interesting uh, thing to do. Yeah, I think it would. This kind of thing would only benefit from a lot of collaboration. So. For sure, for sure. Um, I also see that all of you are adding, uh, both you, Sarah and Richard, are adding a answers to people's questions in the document. Uh, so if you have questions that haven't been answered, um, things are uh, popping up there. <laughs> um, both of you are very helpful and very amazing uh, in offering your, your expertise. Um, we are almost at time. Uh, are there any things that you feel like uh, you want to bring up from this document specifically before we end that might be um, good to answer? Um, I guess it's just like a last note. Um, you know, this is the way that I teach the tool to students as well. Like, there are so many resources for Twine mm -hmm. online that, like, pretty much any question you can just google it you know like um obviously we're here to answer your questions so we can answer the ones that we have now but if there's something we haven't addressed or if you're looking to do something specific you know google and twine just work really well together mm -hmm. um so like you know you do have to be specific so you would again have to make sure like twine to harlow you know how to do xyz that is a constraint on that um but yeah, like there's just so much you can do just from Googling because there really are just so many resources and then just playing around with them. You know, sometimes you have to put a space between something. You have to always check for the case sensitivity, mm -hmm. um, those types of things that are going to be true in any kind of coding situation. But um, like Richard noted, this is often um, a nice gateway for people to get into more complex coding languages and things. Yeah, it seems like it's probably a good idea to familiar, familiarize yourself with, uh, at the very least, some HTML and, and a little bit of CSS just to know um, how things work on the back end, too. Um, this was so amazingly helpful uh, from both of you. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that the, the 150, 200 people who attended the webinar also think so. Uh, thank you, Sarah and, um, and Richard, so much for, uh, for leading this webinar. Um, I see people are uh, posting in the chat uh, thank you messages. Uh, if you want to watch the webinar again, we will post it to the YouTube channel, so uh, it will be available there. Um, hopefully, what we can do is that we can create a, a, a page on Facebook where we can sort of uh, congregate um, resources and, and um, keep in touch about uh, using this tool specifically for teaching and research um, uh, specific ideas and projects and whatnot. So thank you both so much for joining us. And thank you all of the people who, um, who were here as well, uh, attending virtually from everywhere. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Thanks for watching.